Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Quality Online Course Series Course Content and Instructional Materials. Uh, you will have two presenters today. My name is Tracy Miller, and I'm the Online Teaching Coordinator here in Faculty Development Instructional Design Center. And I will be joined with Stephanie Richter, our Assistant Director, uh, just a little bit later in the session. Everything's moving slow this afternoon. So to get things started, I just want to go over our workshop objectives. And what we're going to be talking about today is how you will be able to discover and create content and instructional materials which will contribute to your course learning objectives. In the second part of the session, we will be talking about how you can communicate the nature and use of your course content and instructional materials for your students. So I am going to begin things by talking about the first one, the Discover and Create section, and, um, and then we'll move into the other section. But I'd like to start it off with a little bit of a discussion. Um, which one of the followings do you use for instructional materials in an online course? And if you could just add your answers into the text chat area. Um, I've given you some prompts, some ideas here, but if you could just sort of share um, what sort of instructional materials you're already using. All of the above. Great job, Isabel. All of the above. I can see more all. OK, so we're pretty, we have a pretty good variety of here of what we like to use in our course. Um, so the next question I have for discussion is, how do you know which type of instructional material you'd like to use? Bill uses articles, um, videos, multimedia, lectures, a nice variety. OK, so Isabel, you start with the textbook and then, then add other things. Oh, I like your answer, Bill. Uh, depends on what learning I'm trying to encourage. And um, that is a great segue uh, to what we're going to talk about. Uh, because what we need to do is we really recommend that you start with your learning objectives. Um, because the instructional materials and the course content that you add to your online course um, really need to align with those learning objectives. And so in this particular um, slide, I really made the alignment very intentional. So um, I'm, I'm reading Jennifer's here, audio embedded PowerPoint to get basic information and to add, um, add other information. That sounds really good, Jennifer. Um, so this idea is that you start with a learning objective, and then you pick your instructional materials uh, that will best align with that learning objective. And so in this case, our learning objective is to identify examples of formative and summative evaluation. And so what we've sort of identified here is that we found a YouTube that really addresses that um, learning objective. And so right off the bat, you know, we kind of know that they're aligned and, and they um, kind of go together in a, in a very specific way. Um, just a little note, because we don't always do this. Down on the bottom, we have added uh, the workshop learning objectives to all the slides, because this, this presentation, this webinar, is actually um, sort of part of our instructional materials. And so we're being very intentional in each of these slides and how they align with our workshop objectives today. So if you're curious about what you're seeing down here on the bottom, uh, that was kind of our uh, are um, kind of maybe overdoing the connection uh, to objectives in the instructional materials, um, but we thought we were really drive home the point that way. 
So when you're talking about aligning the learning objectives, you want to not only make sure that they align with the instructional material, but then there's going to be some way that you're going to be able to measure uh, the student's learning, and that's always through the assessment. And so I'm not going to talk about assessments today that much. We actually uh, did that in our last um, session. But I just wanted to point how this kind of goes together. So we have our learning objective, our instructional material, and um, just a sample assessment that could be used um, in order to kind of connect all the dots for students um, and make it just really obvious to them. Any questions so far on alignment? OK, if you could give me a check box um, next to the polling area again, can you tell me um, if this is a typical exercise for you that you would try to align these in a very intentional way? I see lots of green check boxes. I am very impressed. So the next point that I'd like to bring up is a checkpoint. So as you're creating your in, in, instructional materials, um, or maybe even discovering instructional materials, and we're going to talk about um, discovering in just a minute, um, it's kind of nice to create a table like the one that you see in front of you. In this case, this is actually from one of um, Stephanie's classes that she teaches. And she's identified a series of module level objectives um, in her course. And what we've done is taken sort of these instructional materials across the top, different um, different kinds of instructional materials you might use in an online course. And we literally have um, checked off where we fit, we think each of these uh, different instructional materials fit into the course and how they are aligned with the module objective. And so what you're looking for there is you know, that everything does have some kind of instructional material that goes along with it, um, and that they're also um, sort of varied and, and interesting. Now, if you find that you have a learning objective that um, doesn't have any kind of instructional material, um, that's when you're going to have to go ahead and um, start to discover or create your own content. Um, so let's talk about discovering a little bit. How do you currently find your course content or instructional materials? And if you could just share that in the chat area. I see some typing going on. Key textbooks, lit reviews. Oh, lots of resources from people that you follow on Twitter. That's great. Using your connections. On the web, journals, videos, online resources. We definitely have good content curators in this group. Well, I'm going to give you some um, ideas that we've already talked about, but hopefully expand on that, give you some new ideas on how you can discover uh, instructional materials. And so again, I've, I've started by focusing on a learning objective, in this case, selecting an appropriate model of evaluation for a real world program, again, borrowing from Stephanie's evaluation course. Um, and so what I always like to do is, you know, somebody might have already created some great content, and so I'm going to try to seek that out first. And so I'm going to look at open educational resources. And if you're not familiar with this term yet, um, I just love some of the resources that are out there. What I have in the screen next to me is actually um, some content that I found from a repository called the Open Educational Resource 
commons.org and I just put a few things into the search engine and I can actually find content um, or instructional materials that fit my learning objective. Now there's a couple things I look for when I use an open educational resource. Um, one of them is um, that the, the subject fits, um, that the level of the um, material fit. So in this case it's saying post-secondary, so that looks really good. Um, I'm also looking for the Creative Commons attribute, and that means that um, whoever actually did create this um, has given me free reign to use it, and as a matter of fact, um, it says no strings attached in this particular um, resource that I found. Um, and so that means that, you know, I'm, I'm free to either use it in my course or maybe even um, adapt it in some way. So here are some of the things that um, allows you to do a quick evaluation of some instructional resources. And of course you want to look through it and make sure it really does um, kind of address that learning objective that you're looking for. Um, the second one is other online resources. And I put an asterisk next to it here because we can certainly do Google searches um, or even discover content um, through our um, Twitter contacts or other resources like that. But we still want to be really careful that the resources are something that we can use um, or even that they're um, that they're true, our scholarly work, so that we're giving our students um, information um, that we know will be valuable and relevant to them. Um, we don't want to forget about our university resources that we have here. Um, so I'm talking about the library, um, other support groups, um, even our colleagues um, that might share some of the resources, and we want to we want to keep a an open dialogue going on about how those resources are available. Um, and then we actually put this one down at the bottom because I think this is sort of the, the first one that we pull out in oftentimes, and that's finding a, you know, a good textbook or um, some publisher content that can be added to your online course um, easily. So some of the things that we should consider when we're selecting instructional materials, um, and we've talked about this first one a lot, um, content should be relevant to the learning objectives. So, you know, I just can't say that enough. Um, we want to keep that in our focus um, at every point when we're selecting different instructional materials. Um, the content should represent up-to-date thinking or practices in the discipline. And um, I think one of the obvious ones we think of is this idea that um, it should be current. So if we're, we found this really great journal article um, you know, through one of our resources, um, but we found that it would, maybe it was authored in um, the 1980s or something like that. You know, we probably want to find something that's more cur current and up to date. Um, however, that doesn't always need to be the case. Um, different disciplines have, uh, and different theories have different points of time. Maybe it's a historical resource. You can't just um, go looking for a newer version of the Declaration of Independence. Um, or it's seminal. So it's something that um, is an accepted practice, an accepted um, theory. And so it's definitely something that um, doesn't necessarily need to be um, the most up-to-date information. Um, and then content should be varied and offer multiple perspectives. And so to sort of break this down, um, the content should offer the students um, multiple or diverse voices. So um, not just the textbook voice or not just your voice, but perhaps uh, multiple perspectives 
um, or different um, opinions on different theories or different practice. And then the idea that it should have different modalities. And so um, modalities is, is such a fun word, but what we mean by that is that it's just not um, written work or just not videos, um, you know, something that will give the students some variety and some choice um, in how they consume uh, the content. Can anyone think of any other things that should be considered when you're selecting instructional materials? OK, I don't see any typers. Um, oh, wait a minute, Jason's typing something in there. And please feel free to type in my next question that I put up for discussion with what is still missing? Oh, accessibility. Jason, we will definitely talk about that soon. Cost, excellent. Right, so as you're going through and you're evaluating um, and discovering content, um, what you may find is that um, the resources that you're finding maybe don't address um, a learning objective. I call it a dangling learning objective where there's you just um, can't seem to discover or find the content um, and the, a point or a key concept that you want to make with a learning objective. Um, and you may, yeah, you may find that the resources out there that you're finding are not completely accessible to your students um, or that, you know, you found a great textbook, um, but, it, you know, you realize that it's going to be a financial burden for your students. So very good point. So as you're finding these gaps, um, oh, and one of the other gaps is, so far if you are sort of discovering this content, you may not be adding your own voice to the content. So what you need to do is sort of put yourself into those diverse voices that your students are hearing from. So I just like to kind of compare and contrast between some of the uh, content that you might have discovered and then some ideas about how you might be able to fill in the gap. So in this example, I'm still kind of back on the models of evaluation learning objective that um, I borrowed from Stephanie's course. And so in the process of my discovery, let's say I found some videos. And over here on the right-hand side, I've, I've kind of put some screenshots in there of some of my discovered content. Um, so I found some videos, um, I found some um, journal articles, and of course I've identified my textbook, and so I feel really good about that, but then again, I'm sort of missing uh, my own voice or maybe connecting the dots between the instructional materials, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about how I'm going to create some presentations that are going to fill in those gaps. And, and maybe um, I'm going to make it a little bit different so I have that different modality for my students. Um, or um, I wasn't completely satisfied with the presentations that I found online um, because they were not, um, I wasn't allowed to use them because of fair use or copyright or they weren't completely accessible. And so in this case, I'm going to create a presentation, kind of trying to maybe several presentations, of course, to fill in those gaps. Um, another way is um, a synchronous session. And so, you know, maybe I'm going to offer some live webinar type sessions like we're doing today so that we can have um, a just-in-time um, discussion on the content and, and maybe something that wasn't already covered in some of the instructional materials. Um, and just as another option of something that um, you might want to create is this idea of a faculty blog. And that's sort of the, the purest way you can um, represent your voice on a topic. And a blog's um, kind of nice because it um, 
can actually feature um, a couple different modalities. So maybe there's sort of an article written in it. You can embed your videos into it um, or even link out to other resources um, that you want to share with your students. So it's kind of my last piece. Um, I wanted to talk about this idea of evaluating your instructional materials. And uh, this is actually a um, rubric that I created, um, and it was to evaluate open educational resources. But what I did was I added a couple of other um, criteria over here that kind of matches up. And again, it's sort of another checkbook. So when I look at an instructional material, or if I'm even creating um, some instructional materials, what I'm going to look for, again, is that you know, how well does it meet the learning objectives? Um, am I creating a nice variety um, and allowing the students to have a lot of choice and hear those div diverse voices? Um, in the instructional materials that I am choosing to add into my online course. Again, as you're developing or designing your course, um, does the instructional materials, uh, are they current, historical, seminal, like we talked about before? Um, but this also might be an update. So let's say you've um, been doing this course for a while, and you're looking back, you're refreshing, um, and you're trying to bring your resources back up to date. And so you can pull this out and kind of look at your instructional materials and decide whether some of them um, need a little refresher and a little updating. Um, maybe it's even your, uh, your PowerPoint presentations, if you use something like that. Um, it doesn't now need... Um, some more current events added to it, or just um, a little bit more updating on the, the most recent practice or theory in your discipline. And then we did talk about um, this a, a little bit, but I always like to add this to the end. We're actually going to talk about accessibility um, when we cover the accessibility and usability um, webinar um, a little bit later in this semester. But when you're picking out instructional materials, um, that still needs to be at the forefront of um, how you're picking them. So, you know, is this something that you're able to um, share with your students um, and add into your course? And then, of course, how accessible are they to um, the most amount of students um, that is possible. So, uh, you know, you're looking for closed caption um, with your YouTube videos, or you're using PDFs um, so they're screen readable, um, that sort of thing. So, nice tool to kind of be able to sit back and evaluate your instructional materials, um, either piece by piece or in whole, um, especially when we're talking about variety. You want to be able to offer um, a lot of choices to your students. Um, so any questions on discovering and creating instructional materials um, in a very short amount of time? All right, well, I don't see any um, tapping in there, but I will be certainly happy to answer questions as they come up. But I do want to turn things over um, to Stephanie. She is going to tell us a little bit about how we should be communicating our instructional materials to our students. Thank you so much, Tracy, uh, for your, introdu your introduction on content. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit and start looking at our second objective. You'll have to bear with me a little bit because my um, connection seems to be fairly slow here, so I might have to pause a few times. The second objective, to reiterate, was looking at how you communicate the nature and the use of the content and materials that you use to your students. So my first question is, Similar to the one that Tracy already asked, so I'm not going to ask you to answer it this time. 
while you use the materials that you do. But I will reiterate, of course, that um, the correct answer, quote unquote, not that there is really a correct answer, but one of your answers, part of your answer should be because that will support students in achieving the learning objectives and outcomes that you have established. That's, of course, as Tracy mentioned, not the only consideration. But what I want to know is, with that as part of your reason, do you actually communicate that to your students? Do your students know why, whatever your reason is, why you've chosen the materials that you do? Do your students know how you expect them to use those materials and why they are important? Um, feel free to post comments as we go in the chat if you have any answers to that. My, my personal experience has shown that students often feel that these choices are arbitrary, that they don't really understand why you've chosen a particular textbook over another one. Uh, they feel that <laughs> you, they have to buy the $300 textbook because you don't care about the cost or because you aren't aware of the cost or somehow are um, not thinking about students first. So I think communicating why you've chosen something and how it's going to help students with the course and with learning the material and reaching those outcomes can make a huge difference in the classroom climate in general and particularly around how students feel about and how motivated they are to engage with the materials you've selected. My first recommendation then is when you select material, when you assign material, that you actually include a description for each assigned content item, each material that explains why you've chosen it and what students can expect to learn from it. Now, before you start thinking that this sounds like a whole lot of work, it doesn't have to be because it doesn't need to be duplicated for every item. You don't need to duplicate it every time you assign a chapter. But somewhere in your online course, I would highly recommend that you discuss the textbook that you've assigned, perhaps. I've chosen this textbook because it does these things. Um, it might mean connecting your content, the instructional materials, with the objectives, showing how they align by actually putting that information into your course in some way. So as I said, there are multiple benefits. It will help students understand how you've designed your course and the decisions, decisions, pardon me, the decisions that you have made, which in turn helps students feel that you're thinking about them and valuing their experience, which can increase satisfaction. A lot of complaints on course evaluations are that students didn't understand why they had to do something or why something was put together. And in most of those situations, you have thought about it. You've made a conscious decision. But telling students that will help them understand and make them happier. It will also help to motivate students to act actually review the material. In doing research on strategies to help students um, actually do the reading, how do you encourage students and get students to read the material you've assigned, this explanation of purpose is actually one of the, the first easiest factors you can try because it tells students WIFM, what's in it for them, what's in it for me is what WIFM stands for, which in turn then tells them why this is valuable. Instead of just because it's assigned, it's valuable because it will prepare me for this assignment or it explains this theory. I think as faculty and instructors, we assume that students know that reading is valuable or that watching a presentation or watching a video is valuable, but we never communicate why to them. And then lastly, it's a good opportunity for you to help establish connections between two different topics or between different sources on the same topic. If you use two sources that have conflicting opinions about a theory or an event, explain that to students. I want you to read 
Article A and Article B because they have a difference of opinion and I want you to read both and evaluate the argument. When you help students establish those connections, you actually help them start learning before they've ever engaged with the material. You activate their, their mental networks, their cognitive networks as to how information is related and actually help them store information before they ever gain that. So that essentially giving students these descriptions will not only make them happier, it will motivate them more, and it will help them learn more effectively and more efficiently. There are a wide variety of ways that you can do this. I've highlighted three particular methods. Uh, there are plenty more, so if you have a different method, feel free to post that in the, the text chat. My three methods I would recommend are potentially posting a short description in Blackboard along with the assigned material. So if you're assigning them to review content on a website or read an article that you've posted electronically, if you create it as a Blackboard item, you can add a paragraph and it wouldn't have to be a paragraph, it could be just one sentence that explains what this is and why they need to read it. Similarly, if you're doing a recorded presentation or a synchronous live presentation like we are today, you can verbally state it just like you might in class. Um, I think about in class often we'll say, tonight be sure to read chapter four because it will prepare you for our activity on Thursday. You could do the same thing in your session for online course, either live or recorded. And if you do weekly introductions or module introductions, um, I've done these with just short recorded videos, informal with uh, a webcam or I record them with my phone uh, just to give myself the voice, the ability to tell students that this week here's what we're going to be talking about and here's what you will do. And by the way, you're to read chapter four plus watch a video and go over some content on this website. And I want you to do that because I can make that case um, in that video. Does anyone else have other suggestions on how you might accomplish that, um, that same outcome? Well, I don't see anyone typing. Thank you, Jason, um, for, for the suggestions. I can't claim that they're all mine. I wish they were. <laughs> but there are some good ones here. You could, of course, find other ways to do the same thing. So now I have a short poll for you, and hopefully it will come up. I do need to change over the polling options, so just hold on a second. A, B, C, D. Let me know, do you include any content for your, in your courses that's outside of the scope of the learning objective? So these would be optional resources. Is all of your content required or are some optional? So choose A, B, C, or D, but no, you really want students to focus on the core content. Yes, either to refresh them on prerequisite material or provide opportunities for them to extend their learning, or maybe you do both B and C, which would be choice of D, that you offer optional materials for prerequisites and for extension. So I changed the checkbox that was a check or an X to an ABCD, and you can choose an option there. Right now it's looking like a few of you provide opportunities to extend learning. A few of you do both. I'm curious if any of the others of you have a, a suggestion, so I'll leave it for just a second. Isabel, you say you provide choices. Could you expand on that a little bit more? I think I know what you mean, but I don't want to assume that. So I'd love for you to explain the choices that you offer a little bit more detail. And while you do that, it looks like you're a little split. So some of you offer opportunities to extend learning. Some of you offer opportunities to do both extension and prerequisite review. Um, 
and that's great. I'm glad to see that you're you're thinking beyond the the scope of the course. There are times when you don't want to offer too much in terms of optional material, of course, because you don't want students to get off track and lose sight of what the course is really about, that core content. But I think giving students ways that they can learn on their own um, and make some choices is good. So Isabel, you say you offer, in the discussions, you offer choices for students. Excellent. I've done that too, both with the, um, the choice of what discussion question they want to answer, or you said in your case, each of the discussion choices has materials assigned to it. That's some great variety and a great opportunity for students to really personalize their learning. Excellent suggestion. Thank you, Isabel. So in looking at optional material, if you don't include material on prerequisite content, um, here are some of the, the reasons you might want to do that. Uh, I would consider this to be any review of content that's outside of the scope of your course. This might be a refresher on some more basic information they need in order to engage with your course, or it might be um, a review of content outside of the field that they do need. For example, uh, if you were teaching a course on physics that required that students calculate, um, do some advanced mathematical calculation, even though teaching the math isn't part of your content, you might include some of that as a, a resource, as a refresher for students so that they can be more effective in looking at the content. So this content could, the optional prerequisite review could cover uh, material that students should have gotten in high school that they may not have. Uh, it might include things that they need to refresh from a course that they took earlier. Or they might need to relearn material that they did have, but that was presented in a, um, as a theoretical perspective or a general perspective, and now they need to apply it. They may have forgotten that material and need to revisit it. The other type of content that I'm including here is potentially optional, has to do with offering uh, those opportunities to extend learning. So for example, here, this really well uh, dovetails with Tracy's perspective on offering multiple voices and variety in your content. Uh, you might, if you have a particular, if your textbook takes a particular stance on an issue, you might want to provide optional content that looks at it from a different perspective. Or this is a great way to incorporate uh, more aspects of multiculturalism and diversity. If your required content, if your textbook, again, takes a very narrow approach, you might offer, you might require some extended learning around multiple, um, multi, excuse me, around diversity. Or you might incorporate that at least as optional content if you aren't going to require it. You can also include optional content to let students explore a topic in more detail. Sometimes students are so taken by one aspect of the course that you have to sort of skim over in order to get through all of the learning objectives for the course. But adding some additional content would let students who are interested have another place to start in order to dig deeper in that topic and learn more. Again, this is really tying into the, the andragogy of learning, of teaching, that's the theory of teaching adult learners, adult learning theory, how you approach adults as learners, and choice and options for self-actualization like this are one of the key ways to motivate adult learners. You can also, as Jason mentioned, he said he has students contribute their own content. You might have students become experts in a certain area and have them find resources to share with classmates that would then be optional. Um, I think of, again, questions that might come up in class at some point or a question that comes up on a discussion board that isn't necessarily central to the course, but if a student wants to explore it, help them do more research and become an expert on that subtopic, but then share the results back with the rest of the course, the class, in case anyone else is interested. And then whenever possible, if your course doesn't already uh, 
use a lot of current events or recent studies. Including that as optional content is, again, a great way to enrich your material by keeping, um, keeping those current events there. Those can be very motivating for students as well. Let me pause for a moment. I need some water. When you do include both required and optional content, it is really important to make sure that there's a distinction between those for students because, of course, the cynical way to look at it is that students want to know what the minimum is that they need to do. But I think that's very cynical. I think it's better to look at it as your responsibility to be clear about requirements and expectations for students. So some ways that you can do this is either creating a separate folder for optional resources or a separate menu item on your course menu that is for optional or extended resources or review material. You could identify it in, if you have a list of all of the assigned materials for the course, you might mark them as optional there, have a separate list of optional materials. Or what I try to do is when I post what the required readings and videos and materials are for the week, I mark them consistently with the same marking as being optional. So for example, if this was uh, this week read chapter four and chapter eight, parentheses, optional, so that they know that that applies to the content this week, but I'm not expecting them to do so. Does anyone else have suggestions on how they designate optional materials? Oh, again, it doesn't look like it, but feel free to send those in if I move on too quickly. Another aspect of communicating these materials to your students is to think about how you actually tell students what the material is and how they read it or how they should find it. Um, so my recommendation here is whenever appropriate, whenever possible, use an academic citation format. Whatever is suitable for your discipline. So in education, we use the, the APA format. Um, in other fields, you might have a different standard citation format. But that's what I would recommend for introducing your materials. Why do you think that is? Anyone have a, a good response to why you should use a, a citation format for communicating materials to students? Katie, real life application, yes, they can see that citation format actually in use, that it's not something you made up, right? I see a few others typing, so I'll hold off for a second. Robin says to model what they may need to use in their own work. Definitely, if you expect students to follow a particular citation format, I think modeling that you do it too is a great way to, as Isabel later comments, reinforce what you expect them to do. And Jason, very good. Jennifer, yes, so that they can follow the same format. It's also good for them to see those examples, not only you modeling the behavior to reinforce it as desirable behavior, but also to give them some examples. A few other reasons why I think that formal citation is important. The first one is it gives students all of the information they need about that source in case they need to find it from a different source or in a different format. Uh, for example, if you have a textbook that you want your students to purchase, but they can't afford it through the, uh, the bookstore, that would give them the information they needed to find it from an online vendor that might be cheaper, to request it from the library, or um, to find it from, <coughs> excuse me, in an ebook format. Or if you post an article that you've scanned out of a journal and it's not accessible to a screen reader, Having the full citation helps them find it in a screen reader friendly format. As we mentioned, it models good practice and gives them examples for what this would look like. 
but finally, I think it also demonstrates that you have a commitment to academic integrity, that you are citing material correctly, and that you expect them to do as well. When we talk about plagiarism, which is an assessment topic and not a content topic, uh, but touches on here, it's often felt that some of the tools we use to detect plagiarism is, is only solving the wrong end of the problem. It's trying to find students who plagiarize instead of educating them and showing that we have a commitment to academic integrity. So you showing it yourself, I think, is an important aspect of that. Naturally, not everything has an academic citation format. Um, and when I post a YouTube video, for example, I don't cite it academically, but I do provide attribution, just as I would expect them to in a less formal setting. But for academic materials, I definitely suggest the formal citation method. So I've summarized on this next slide some of the suggestions for clearly communicating your materials to students. The first one I'll show you an example of in a moment, in fact, I'll show you an example of most of these, is using a consistent structure. Wherever you post them in your course, in an online course, I like posting materials in each module, as well as in a separate readings, resources, materials area, so that students can see that clearly chunked by, by module, so they know here are the, here's the introduction to the week, the objectives, the resources you need to review, the activities, the assessments for this module, all in one place. But if they want to go find all of the readings together, I post those elsewhere as well. But I do that consistently so that every module, every folder has the same structure. That helps students find things quickly and easily. I use the standard academic citation format. Uh, I help students understand why they need to use each of the materials by posting a purpose, and how to use those materials so that they know, they see the connection between that chapter and what they need to do for their assignments, their assessments, or their learning activities. And then I also clearly designate when something is required versus when something is optional. So this example comes from a course I taught this fall on evaluation, the one that Tracy borrowed some examples from. And this is one chapter's reading and resource folder. So if they clicked reading and resources, that would take them into the folder where they could get to any of the digital content. But this wasn't all digital. I want to point out at the left here, let me grab my pointer, at the left that I used a consistent structure. So every module had the same headings of textbook reading. I used a textbook citation with the chapters in brackets, and then additional resources below. So they could predict what that was going to look like every week. As I mentioned, I used the proper academic citation style to model best practices. I also offered a little bit of guidance here. So I told them that I'm assigning chapters 4 and 10, but that they should focus more on chapter 10 because it's more practical. I could have gone into more detail, but I left this one just very short to give them that guidance for how to use this. I also very clearly marked that these additional resources were recommended and not required because I wanted them to know that these were here for extension or if they needed to see a different way to review that. Um, I also should point out that for this course, I used videos as an introduction for each week. And so because of that, that was where I gave my purpose statements. So for this week, my video would have sounded something like, so this week, out of the, the textbook, I'd like you to read chapters 4 and 10, but you can focus more on chapter 10 because it really, well, it's more practical of the two. 4 introduces some theory. Um, but 10 will really dig into how do you do this, and that will help you as you complete the discussion board assignment that you should do this week. I've also given you some recommended resources. If you want to see um, other models, 4 and 10 sort of summarize the models, but chapters 5 through 9 actually go into each model in specific detail. In case you wanted to read on a particular model, I don't expect you to read on all of them. That's a lot to do. 
But then there are also a few other resources that you might want to explore. Particularly, I gave you an infographic on Kirkpatrick's four levels of evaluation, which is outside of what we're covering for today. But it's one of the most common models used for evaluating training and professional development. I thought you might be interested. So that was a bit long, and that's part of why I gave it as a video. That would be a lot for students to read as part of an introduction, a purpose statement. But by doing that, I really gave students the same information I would give them face to face and helped them see how they put those pieces together. My introduction would have included more on the topic before it and more on the assessments after it, but that video then helps them understand how to get started with the week. Pardon just a moment while my connection catches up. We do want to point out, while our session today, while all of these quality online course workshops focus on online teaching in general and what good online course design looks like overall, we do want to highlight how these topics align with the Quality Matters rubric. So if you aren't familiar, NIU has officially adopted Quality Matters as a course design rubric and a course review process. You can find out more about Quality Matters in the first webinar we gave in the series called Ensuring Quality in Your Online Course. That archive is available on our website. We'll also include it in the follow-up email here. Uh, but that will give you an overview for what Quality Matters is really all about. From this perspective, if you are interested in QM and how you can implement this, this workshop today aligns with standard four primarily. Standard four is all about the instructional materials and content of your course. So from that perspective, quality courses use current historical or seminal instructional materials that support the learning objectives through diverse voices and multiple modalities with clearly communicated purpose and use, proper citations, and an obvious distinction between required and optional materials. So following what we covered today actually applies to all of the six substandards, the specific review standards in general standard four of quality matters. To summarize overall, <laughs> what we've talked about today with, with content. It's been a lot, we'll, we admit. <laughs> but ultimately, what's important is that your instructional materials support your learning objectives, that they align, that you use a variety of instructional materials, both materials you found and materials that you create. Certainly, finding them is much easier, <laughs> much not necessarily quicker, but technically easier than creating materials. And it's important that you communicate those materials clearly to students, including the purpose for why they need to complete, why they need to review a particular material, how you cite it, and whether it's required or optional for them to extend their learning. With that, I'm going to invite Tracy back in here. And offer up if you have any questions. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have about what we've covered or anything we left out that you have a question about. Feel free to use the text chat, or if you'd like to raise your hand, then we'll turn the microphone over to you, and you can ask your question verbally. I see a few typing. At least one typing, so mm -hmm. hold on for a second. Jennifer will actually be um, leaving you with a, a archive when we send you a follow-up email, so you can watch the uh, the presentation again. Yes, and we encourage you to do so. All right, if there are no other questions, 
I want to again thank all of you for attending today. We look forward to seeing you at one of the upcoming uh, entries in this series. We have one on learning activities coming up next, as well as technology, usability, and accessibility. Um, and a final session for the semester is on, um, Tracy, refresh my memory, on oh, getting students started for the semester. Getting all started. of those are available on our website now. And if you're watching the archive, all of those will be archived soon, too. Look for those. Thank you so much. Thank you.